guest. And so he is actually scheduled to preach May 5th. Don't want to miss that. It's going to begin a series on the Ten Commandments on May 5th, and he'll <laughs> kick it off. And so we're really glad you're here today. Just visiting still because he's still in sabbatical. He, had, he was thinking about ending early, and the Lord gave him a dream and said, don't end early. So he says, okay, I'm not going to end early. <laughs> Isn't it nice when God says things kind of clearly? You know, sometimes it's kind of like, what are you saying, Lord? And other times he's just like, I'm just going to give you a clue. <laughs> it's going to be clear. Yeah. And then, of course, Malachi is home. Yeah. Thank you, Malachi. Malachi is um, a missionary, and he's our son, my, our Jeff and I's son, of course, but he's also a missionary with Contend, and he's home for six weeks um, fundraising. Yeah, that's great. So then he can race off to the nations all summer. All right, I am excited for today. We are in a series called Sign the Line, Altars, Covenants, and Consecration. And today I want to talk about living in covenant as a family of God. Yes, we have little individual families, right, which are super important. But living in covenant with God's family. So uh, look around. You are surrounded by friends. But you're surrounded, some, a lot of people you don't even know around you, or well, maybe. But you're surrounded by brothers and sisters. You're surrounded by spiritual moms and dads. You are surrounded with a family that has a bond as strong as blood. Christ's blood, actually. And God is so devoted to relationship that he was willing to go to do whatever it took to bring you into relationship with him, right? And he was so devoted to relationship that that same act that brought you into relationship with him also brought you into a family where you then had divine relationship with brothers and sisters that were also in his family. What's it say that you're adopted into his household through what he's done for us? It says literally um, in Romans, I think it's 8, that he's given you the spirit of adoption. Do you know a child that is legally adopted in every single way has all the rights legally of a child that is um, naturally born? Yeah. Yeah. And since we have at least 10% of our congregation that is adopted, <laughs> we know this well. Do you guys know that? We've counted it up before. I think 12, 12 adopted kids or something. It's, it's literally over 10% of our congregation. Yeah. It's fun. So fun. So through what Christ did, he gave us the Holy Spirit. And he says the Holy Spirit is, gives you the spirit of adoption. You are now in the family, right? And so he also, though, gives us, he's, he's so wanting us to understand this idea of family, of spiritual family, that he, he gives us the covenant of marriage, and he decides that marriage is going to be a picture, a living picture for every person of the commitment that Christ has for us, who he calls his bride, and that we have for Jesus that we call the bridegroom. And he, he, God is the one that instituted marriage. And he wanted every single one of us to have a living example, a daily picture of family for, in our own lives, but of the family of God too, of his devotion to us. When Jesus was on the earth, Jesus had an earthly family. Do you know Jesus still has that earthly family? It's wild. Mary was a real person. What is it like to be in heaven as Mary? Yeah. <laughs> 
She's like, no, my son really is the best. <laughs> My son is better than all of you. <laughs> no, my son really is perfect. Because <laughs> I got some perfect sons that I adore. <laughs> but um, none of them are quite as perfect as Mary's firstborn son. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> okay. G Mary is still Jesus' mom. Now, we don't, that doesn't make her someone we pray to or we give veneration to. But it's a thing still. He was born as a baby to a real family. And they had more sons and daughters afterwards. And Jesus talks about his brothers and sisters, his earthly brothers and sisters. But in Matthew 12, so he has a real family. He has, he has a real earthly family. It's crazy that he submitted himself to that path. But um, in Matthew 12, while Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. So mama arrives with the siblings and they're like, they want to talk to Jesus. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. And he replied to them, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Now he's not being disrespectful. We see many times how honoring he was of his family. He's making a point here. He says, who are my mother, who are my brothers? And then pointing to his disciples pointing to those that are believers, that are following God, he said, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Relationships are a really big deal to God. Our relationships our relationship with God was so messed up at the fall. I mean, sin completely messed up our ability to interact with God in any kind of healthy way. And, and the Lord was so devoted to relationship that he put in the plan of redemption. But I don't think we understand how devoted the Lord is to rela earthly relationships. <clears throat> Jesus died so we could be part of a family so that you could have brothers and sisters. Heavenly Father. He came for a relationship. And that's kind of countercultural because in our culture, you ever hear it called, oh, cancel culture, right? We just tend to kind of throw out Anything and anyone we don't agree with. And there's, oh, thank you. Are you mentoring him, Joe? Wow, Gabriel. You keep, keep mentored by that. <laughs> yeah, Joe is, Joe is like, he takes care of the speaker so well. Thank you, Gabriel. That was awesome. Um, where was I at? Cancel culture. But God's calling us to something different as his family. Relationships are not actually disposable. Not if we're going to renew our mind. And there's certain, I mean, I, I love America. I am American. I'm not like bashing America. But we have to acknowledge the parts of our culture that affect us daily that are super toxic and just unbiblical. And if we can't acknowledge it, we can never live above it into the, in the kingdom of God. So, uh, you know, I love America. America has got its own culture. Some things are glorious about it. Some things are really terrible about it. And um, one thing is that I'm not sure we value family to the level that God values family. So covenant relationships, which is what Jesus died for, they're just not disposable at all. I think of, uh, sometimes I think of like Lisa, when I think of someone who just lives out valuing relationships. How many of you know Lisa Summers? I think she just went out with the kiddos, yeah. That woman is constantly thinking about how to value people and protect people's hearts. I think, wow, what an example. Now, I want to clarify just for a second. I'm not talking about 
distancing yourself from relationships that are taking you to hell. All right? I am not talking about that right now. Doesn't the Lord also say that um, bad company corrupts good character? We choose our friends carefully. We choose our relationships carefully. It says, um, what does light have to do with darkness? Don't be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever because it will take you, they'll pull, you know, a yoke. Like an oxen puts a yoke on and there's two, two oxen that maybe is pulling a plow. What if one is just going to plow left? That's it. They're just pulling left. How can the other one stay straight, right? That's the picture. Don't be unequally yoked with people who don't know Christ. Does that mean that you're not friendly? Does it mean that you're not acquaintances? Of course we are. How can we escape this world or win anyone to the Lord? We're in the world, but we're not of it, right? But who do you walk closely with as brothers and sisters, that's what we're talking about today. And so sometimes we, uh, we think that relationships are disposable. And I've kind of been feeling like having illustrations and object lessons lately. I might make some homemade bread and fit it into a sermon again. Remember that time when I... <laughs> we <laughs> Where is this comment coming from? <laughs> I've been making homemade sourdough. That's where, oh, wrong side. All right. What do we got here? What do we have? Oh, fine dining at its best. We, I, I went into the kitchen and I found a four course piece or whatever, you know, like this is fancy eating right here with the, some of this is what some of you eat on every single day. That's okay. There's no judgment, honestly. But what do we call this? Disposable. Not fine china. We call it disposable. <laughs> we call it disposable. Why do we love this? No dishes. Why is there no dishes? Because nobody keeps it. Well, a few grannies. My grandma would try to keep these. My like, grandma, why do we have to wash it? <laughs> we should not have to wash these, grandma. She lived through the 30s. You just couldn't take it out of her. She was going to try to get three uses out of her paper plate. But we love this because it's disposable. Nobody expects to keep it. When it's done... Look at how little trash takes up. And then when you're done with this, what does your kids do? <laughs> I, I know, horrifying. I don't even want to think what it's like to eat out of this or to consume it. How much of us have we eaten as children? And why do we not care? It's disposable. Ever try to eat a steak with one of these? Might go through three or four forks. Ooh, that, yeah. Hit me in the face. That was okay. <laughs> They're disposable. After you're done with your chili, throw it in the fire pit, whatever. You know, there's some places in the world you can't buy disposable product. It just doesn't matter how many people are at your house. You're just not going to buy disposable products. You're going to wash the dishes. <laughs> but there's another way in God's kingdom. And it's treating relationships as precious, as sacred, as holy, as a gift Treating godly relationships as something worth fighting for rather than running from. That is the family that we've been brought into. These are my great grand, no, these are my great, yeah, my great grandmother's dishes. I know some people aren't into family stuff, but I think it's kind of cool when I get some stuff that's like really has some history. So they're, they're pioneers in the Black Hills. 
They didn't have very much, ni actually, they didn't have very many nice things. But my grandmother got her mom's dishes. And I think they're, they're I'm sure they're not really valuable, valuable, but they're valuable to me, and I'm not ever going to get rid of them. I'll give them to my children someday. This little orchid pattern. They're probably over 100 years old. It's not disposable. It's precious. Actually, I keep it in this special cupboard called a china cupboard. Like my grandma used to. Actually, the china cupboard is my grandma's now that I think about it. She gave it to me. So I have a special cupboard with glass on it in which these dishes are. Does anyone else have something like this in their house maybe? Maybe. Okay. Well, I love that I have that, right? And in it are my grandma's dishes. And every once in a great while, literally not when we're going to eat a hot dog, right? When you're going to eat a hot dog, you pull out the disposable, right? But there's something about trying to eat a beautiful meal on disposable plates. It's not the same, is it? These aren't disposable. They're treasured. They're valued by my family. I don't have that much that belonged to my great-grandmother. And when my kids get it, they'll be able to say their great-great-grandmother use these dishes. Hopefully it'll mean something to them. If not, eventually, whatever. Can't take anything with us, so we can't hold on to it too tightly. But the point is, for the illustration, relationships aren't disposable. They're like the fine china in your life to be treasured and cared for. When my kids were little and we'd pull these out to use them for a special meal because I wanted something to be really special, guess what? I didn't let them pick them up from the table and take them over to the sink. I'm like, leave your plates at the table. I'll clear it. Nobody, no little five-year-old's going to carry this one <laughs> into the sink and dump there. Why? Because I treasured it. Because he valued it. God, va do you think God values you as his children? Do you think God values his child sitting next to you? Do you think he values the child sitting next to you as much as he values you? How do you think God as a father feels about you when you don't value his child sitting next to you? Sad. When Malachi and Abby were little and Malachi pinned Abby down and farted on her head. <laughs> and then when she was sleeping, that's how she woke up. She <laughs> woke up with him, his butt on her face. Far he had clothes on, but <laughs> I had to add that detail. Farting really, really loud. And that's how she woke up in which she was then Full on screaming and was going to try to strangle him. That was, eight. That was, eight. That was last year. <laughs> just kidding. I just, yes, he was little. That didn't make me as a parent happy. <laughs> to see them now trying to like kill each other. And she was like, ah, Greg! Like, she's out of control. And he thought that her pain was hilarious. And we laugh about it now, but at the time, well, we might have laughed about it a little bit at the time in private, but not. No, I was, that isn't, I was like, that is not okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then daddy and I shut the door and we're like, oh my goodness. What possesses these children? The creativity that comes forth. So there, there are two kinds of, I'm going to say, relationships within the body of Christ. Number one, every single born-again believer is your brother or sister, all across the entire world. Now, you're not in relationship with them all, but we should honor them, treasure them, value them, pray for them. Like How, how, have, how many of you ever been to a Friday night house of prayer when we pray for the persecuted church? Because we're remembering our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world who are suffering in ways that maybe we're not, but we want to stand with them. 
So, but you, but you're not walking closely with every single person across the earth. But we can still love them, treasure them. We can, we can speak well of God's church. Do you know what? This really has a lot of practical context because a lot of people take this pulpit and take this, not this pulpit, but take the pulpits in their church, take the microphones and spend a lot of time pointing out the faults of other churches and streams in the body of Christ. That is a waste. That is a waste of time. It's an absolute waste of time. I have been in services where I don't even want to say denominations out loud because I just like, if you're a believer, then you're my brother and sister, but be like in a service and here comes the pastor. Well, you know, our brother, our Baptist brothers and sisters down the street would believe this. I'm like, why did you have to say that? Just preach the truth. Why do you have to point out that your Baptist brothers and sisters believe something different? If you are from a Baptist stream, welcome, welcome. Well, I am so glad you're here. I don't think that that phrase has ever been uttered from this pulpit because that is ridiculous. Plus, how many bazillion Baptists are there and do they all believe the same thing? That is the most ridiculous thing to be pointing out from the pulpit. Or they're up here and they're like, well, our charismatic brothers and sisters in Christ. Did anyone just get closer to Christ in that statement? No, you know what happened? 20 people in the room just got an offense towards some brothers and sisters in Christ that are down the street that they've never even met. And now they have a wall between them, themselves and that person. Now when they see him at the grocery store, the first thing they think of is, oh yeah, my pastor said that they're kind of like crazy and wild or that they, whatever, I don't know. I'm just making things up. But they don't love the word of God like us do, like we do, like us do. <laughs> they have better English. It's just, everybody is, can be in America because we, we so value like uh, individuality and voicing or airing our opinions that we kind of like celebrate everybody having an opinion about everything. Like, oh yeah, they, we just are little truth warriors out there on social media. And just throwing every other brother and sister in Christ under the bus that doesn't agree with us on our political stance or on our, our favorite theological issue. I'm just... I, I, I'm just going to call it for what it is. It's immature. And I don't care if that person has a triple PhD behind their name. It's immature. Because it is, it is not producing love in God's family. And I, I have a truth bomb for us to think about. No person in this room is theologically 100% correct. But also, no person in this room is purposely believing a lie. Probably. Sometimes we like to sin, and we do kind of purposely believe lies. Yeah, because we're like, oh, we just want to, we don't want to give up our sin. That, you just need to repent of that, but you probably know it in your heart. But otherwise, like, nobody, believe, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I think I'm just going to believe this because I know it's a lie. No, we are, we're all growing, right? We're all learning. We're all looking into the word of truth. And sometimes we're not very humble. And sometimes we are humble. And sometimes we're not very teachable. And sometimes we are teachable. And you know what? You do not have the corner on all truth. But I hope that you believe with sincerity and that you're searching the scriptures. And that I always think it's like this. You shouldn't change what you believe easily. You shouldn't. But you should be able to search the scriptures and change when you see that what you're believing isn't right. When I hear a new idea on a scripture, I'm like, oh, I don't just quickly be like, oh, yeah, no, no what I just believed for the last 10 years isn't right. And I think, no, no, that's a new idea. That might be correct. I think I'm going to search it a little bit now to see. 
I am talking about this. I'm bringing it up because these are some of the obstacles for us to live in covenant with each other. Something called spiritual pride. So God wants us to treasure his family, all of us that are in covenant with him. And then there are people that you're running with in life. So we have the bride of Christ across the whole earth. Obviously, we want to treasure them. We want to treasure, you know, when we walk in, we go do missions work. We go into different cultures, and sometimes something they're doing feels kind of goofy to us because it's just like kind of their culture bleeding through into whatever. You know what? We just love them. We don't want to point it out. We just love them well. We just honor them. We just say, hey, these are brothers, sisters in Christ. Have respect in your heart, right? But then there are people that God has you running with. He has you, he has you living daily, weekly with. I would say like our local family, your local church. Maybe you have people outside of this building that are believers in Christ that you, you meet with, you pray with, you have Bible studies with. And um, there's something such, you know how many people all over the world don't have that? If you have that, treasure it. If you have a spiritual family, Hold on to it dearly. Do you know how hard the enemy works to divide people from their spiritual families? Don't let him do it. Don't let him bring the offense. Don't let him bring that spiritual pride. Ugh. Really, I know in the end that I know so much more than Jeff and Autumn. You might know more than Jeff and Autumn. What did Jeff and Autumn know? <laughs> but don't let it divide you. You hear, you hear one of us come up and preach something, you're like, I have way more revelation on that than they do. And these are real things that people, we think sometimes maybe. Just thank God for the revelation that you have on that. Don't let it divide you. Don't let it bring offense to you. Do not let the devil separate you from the family the local family that God has put you in. There are people in the Middle East that have come to Christ through dreams or through radio or through seeing something on the internet that they don't, they do not know another living human being that's a believer in Christ. They are literally completely alone trying to serve Jesus. Do you know what a gift a church is? It is such a gift. <clears throat> this is what the scripture says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. I love this. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. Say the unity of the Spirit. Oh, okay, there's two people in the room. Okay, let's say unity of the Spirit. Of the Spirit. Right. Through the bond of peace. And this is, I love what Paul says. There is one spirit. Everyone say one spirit. That's right. Just as you were called to one hope. Say one hope. one hope. That's right. When you were called, there's one Lord. Go ahead and say it. One Lord. One faith. One baptism. One God. And Father of all. Right. And he is over all and through all and in all. Amen. Thank you, girls. You're amazing. <laughs> oh. I want us to turn. To, well, I, I won't make you turn to this, but you can if you want to. I'm going to look at Jonathan and David for a minute. So within... Within the church... Um, God's going to give you special friends, right? You know, it's not because you're being clicky. How many of you like to have a, um, I'll call it a best friend, but you know, that's what we called it in kindergarten. How many of you like to have people who know you, that you know them, that you can rely on? <laughs> you girls are great. Yeah. How many of you think we actually need it, right? It's called community. We need it. We need it. And so I want us to look at David and Jonathan because 
David and Jonathan are an amazing picture of a covenant friendship. So within the church, we're all like in the covenant with Christ, right? But there will be certain people the Lord lines you up with to run your race. And whether for a season or for a lifetime, if it's your spouse, it's for a lifetime. That's your covenant partner to run a three-legged race with for the rest of your life. You just got to get in sync with that person. Do whatever it takes to get in sync so you can run your three-legged race together. It's a good illustration. We should have, I should have had us run a three-legged race. You're here. I could have. <laughs> no, there's not time. <laughs> it would be fun. But there are covenant friendships. Do you know that um, I, Jeff and I have known Chad since he was 15 years old? How old are you now, Chad? 41. You seemed so much younger than me back then. Now we're like the same age or something, almost. <laughs> that happens to every young youth pastor. You're, you're <laughs> so Jeff and I, Jeff and I uh, knew Chad from the time he was 15. He's 41. Can you do the math for me? 26 years? 26, yeah. And then Winter, uh, we've known Winter since she was 15. She's younger than you. She's in her 30s. And we don't have to name ages of women, but. Um, Jeff led Winter to the Lord. Yeah, what an honor. When we were in Pierre. He led your wife to Jesus. And then actually, I introduced you to, because you, yeah, I'm going to put that together. Wow. Wow. You're welcome. <laughs> we have been running together for 25 years. You say, like, wild horses could not divide me from Chad and Winter. <laughs> 25 years? They have been our friends for almost as long as we've been married, living in similar locations, doing ministry together. I mean, do you think that there's ever been a time where we could have got offended with each other? <laughs> I'm sure. I actually can't remember any of you guys are perfect, but I'm sure. Times for misunderstanding, for sure. Times where one of us was inconsiderate maybe, wasn't a perfect friend, for sure. If you want anything valuable, you gotta fight for it and stick with it. And if you are gonna treat people like they're disposable every time they disappoint you, you're never going to be running with anyone for 25 years. And that will be, that will be a very sad thing. Dave and Patty. Dave and Patty, Dave and Patty. We were in Pierre. I'm thinking before Malachi was born, right? Malachi was just born. Abby was not born. Yeah. When we met Dave and Patricia Schultz. They had no kids at that time. It was just, they came to the church. They both really got touched by the Lord, River Center and Pier. And then by God's grace, the Lord spoke, I think, audibly to Dave. Audibly and told him to come to Huron with Jeff and I. We were, we were scared to death we were going to come here all alone. We knew how to call this, and we were like, God, who's going to move to Huron with us? And audibly, the Lord spoke to Dave. He said, will you follow that man? That's so humbling. And 20 years, 20 years we've been building the kingdom together and watching each other's families grow up. I was there when Akaya got off the boat from China. Little 10 month old baby. I'm so glad they stuck with us. We were, we were first time leaders. Like, how many mistakes did we make? 
Are you going to ditch your relationships when people make mistakes? Sincere people who love Jesus make mistakes. It's tempting to sometimes. And we, we planted this church when we were like 28 or something. And we were young. First time we'd ever led on our own. First time we'd ever led a team. And on top of that, we weren't just coming into established work. It's really hard to plant a church. It's really, really hard. And really, we stuck with you guys, but that was easy. You guys stuck with us. Thank you. Because <laughs> it really takes a special kind of devotion to be devoted to someone through, through their growth, which that's kind of what we need to do. Through our growth. Through, through like, wow. Could have handled that better. <laughs> mm, wow. I wonder if that was wise. Mm, I wonder if they just spoke before they thought. I mean... When you're going to run with someone for 20 years, you're going to see the good, the bad, the ugly, also the sincere, sincerity. So there are, I pray for each of you, people in your life, certainly your spouses, your children, but other people in your life that, you're gonna, that God wants you to link up to and be committed to, that love Jesus that love you, that you're like, you know, thick or thin, I'm going to be devoted to this person. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run with them, and I'm going to be a Jonathan to a David, or a David to a Jonathan. That's what I want to look at. It's 1 Samuel, starting at chapter 18 um, through chapter 23. We see, um, this is a story of David, honestly, David and, and how he went from shepherd boy to um, in the king's service, and eventually He's going to become the king of Israel. He's really nothing, though. He's just uh, uh, the youngest uh, brother, kind of despised of a large family, um, stuck out there with the sheep, doing the, the grunt labor. And, you know, and, and he's developing his character, though. And it's a story about how he, his, his personal development, David going from nobody knowing his name to being a great warrior who takes down a national enemy, Goliath, immediately brought into the king's service and then into the king's leadership through leading a hundred men, then a thousand men. And then, a, I mean, it's just eventually being like the commander over the entire Israeli army under Saul. So there's this, this story that's unfolding and we see that Jonathan is Saul's oldest son. So the title of king goes from father to oldest son. That is the custom. That's what you see all the way through the Bible. Oldest sons are the ones that get to be king. And so Jonathan is the next king. Yeah, the crown prince, is that what you called him? Yeah. He's the, the Prince William of Israel. <laughs> okay, no diversions, guys. <laughs> and um, I just want to, I want to go through the story of Jonathan and David's friendship because it's a really special friendship that God really gave to David as a gift, in my opinion. And when I look at this relationship of Jonathan and David, I think, wow, what a gift to David. And I also sometimes think Jonathan was more impressive in many ways than David was even. Because Jonathan was the one who had all the power in the natural, who recognized a young man of noble character and said, I'm going to run with him and we're going to be friends. Equal counterparts. And so um, the story opens up in 1 Samuel 18 where um, <clears throat> David just defeats Goliath. And, <clears throat> you know, the two Philistines are on one, one hill. Israel's on the other. Goliath is a giant. They say he's about nine foot tall. He's like really ceiling tall. I mean, the guy was monstrous. 
and he had like I can't remember the spear weighed like 40 pounds or something right or is I mean it's like every piece of his armor was like a normal person couldn't even carry it and he was coming out and taunting Israel every day and the agreement was come out and fight me if you win Israel the Philistines will become your servants and slaves but if we win you're gonna become our servants and slaves nobody would fight him they're like nobody can win and here's David he's never spent one day in battle but he spent a lifetime um, in a sheep pa- in pasture watching sheep. And when he did that, he had worshiped the Lord on his harp, right? That's where he learned in- to be an instrumentalist all that time. And he would practice with a sling, uh, a sling and a rock, slingshot. Maybe against a tree, right? Fourteen hours a day, you get really good with it. I think it was probably his toy. I mean, you know, something to buy, you know, pass the time probably. But in the course of time, he had a lot of integrity. And it, there had been times when a bear and a lion actually attacked the sheep, and David chased them down, and with his bare hands, he rescued the sheep from the lion's mouth. It says, and from the bear's mouth. He was he was courageous. And so he went to battle and, you know, he defeated Goliath and uh, the, the whole Philistine army turned in terror and Israel ran after pillaging them and killing them. And um, it says that, you know, uh, David took Goliath's sword and cut off, or no, yeah, David took Goliath's sword, cut off Goliath's head and um, was like running through the countryside with his head. He was a warrior. And so when the battle was over, he came before King Saul, the victorious conqueror, and says he still had Goliath's head in his hands. Big head. <laughs> A big head. And he's standing there. And, uh, and he's, he's like bringing glory to the Lord and answering to the king for this great battle. And it says that after David had finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, the king's son. There was an immediate bond between them, for Jonathan loved David. From that day on, Saul kept David with him and wouldn't let him return home. And Jonathan made a solemn pact with David because he loved him as he loved himself. Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off his robe and giving it to David together with his tunic, his sword, his bow, and his belt. Then again, in 1 Samuel 20, it says, Jonathan made David reaffirm his vow of friendship again. And then it says again, for Jonathan loved David as he loved himself. What does Mark 12 say that the greatest commandments are? Love the Lord your God, right? With all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself, right? There's no other commandment greater. Jonathan entered into a covenantal friendship with David because he said, I'm, I'm going to love you like I love me. And a healthy person loves themselves takes care of themselves, right? Has integrity and respect for themselves. So a hallmark of Jonathan's covenantal friendship with David is that Jonathan tapped into a love, the love of God for David. And he was able to love him with a selfless love like he loved himself. The second hallmark of Jonathan's covenantal friendship with David was that Jonathan was a friend who defended and protected David. Loyalty. 1 Samuel 19, okay, the story kind of goes sour because David has got so much favor on his life. David is such a great warrior. David's not doing anything. He's just going out there and winning battles and doing his best. And the favor of God is on him. God's giving him success continually. And Saul becomes completely jealous. And there's a whole sermon on envy in there. Because it says the first time it says that he heard some, he heard the, um, the, the women in the towns singing about the, the battle. And it says they were singing, Saul has killed his thousands, David his ten thousands. 
was like a phrase they were singing, celebrating because Israel had won a battle. And it says, Saul heard it and he immediately became jealous. And the next day, a tormenting spirit entered him. Whew, jealousy is torment. Okay, that was free. That's not even about this message here. So 1 Samuel 19, though, Saul becomes so jealous over David, so afraid that David's going to take his place of authority, which he is eventually, but he's just enraged in jealousy, that he actually says he urged his servants and his son Jonathan to assassinate David. But Jonathan, because of his strong affection for David, he told him what his father was planning. So Jonathan goes to David and says, hey, my father is trying to find someone to assassinate you. He says, uh, tomorrow morning, he warned him, you must find a hiding place out in the fields. I'll ask my father to go out there with me and I'll talk to him about you. And then I'll tell you everything I can find out. The next morning, Jonathan spoke with his father about David, saying many good things about him. He said, the king must not sin against his servant David, Jonathan said. He's never done anything to harm you. He's always helped you in any way he could. Have you forgotten about the time he risked his life to kill the Philistine giant and how the Lord brought a great victory to all of Israel as a result? You were, you, were cert, you were certainly happy about it then. Why should you murder an innocent man like David? There's no reason for it at all. So Saul listened to Jonathan and then he vowed, as surely as the Lord lives, David will not be killed. Unfortunately, Saul could only keep that promise for a short time before he tries to kill him again. The whole point is, though, Jonathan could see what was right and was wrong in the situation, was willing to even enter into conflict with his own father because of his covenantal loyalty to David to defend him and to protect him. Later in 1 Samuel 20, it says Jonathan protects David from his father Saul and he sent him away to protect his life when Saul again got stirred up with jealousy and was going to try to kill him. Jonathan was laying down his very life for David. First of all, he himself was in danger of being killed by his own father. His father actually threw a spear at him and tried to kill him at a dinner table because he had defended um, David. Talk about, some of you think you have crazy families. You are in good company. Hopefully your dad didn't try to kill you at the dinner table with a spear, pin you to the wall. But if he did, you can find sympathy with Jonathan. Number three, a hallmark of Jonathan's covenantal friendship with David. Jonathan went out of his way to encourage David. Do you want to be, you want to, you want to be a good covenantal friend with someone? Love them like you love yourself. Defend and protect them. And go out of your way to encourage them. The story keeps going. David is running for his life. And I'm going to summarize because we're land here in just a few minutes. David is running for his life. He, he's got a hodgepodge army that's kind of like collected to him. It says people that were uh, indebted to the king. They were disgruntled. People that were also criminals, they started gathering to him. And so he had 600 men, not the army he was hoping for, I'm sure. And he was uh, running for his life and he was very, very discouraged because the entire Israeli army was trying to manhunt him to kill him. And in that moment, 1 Samuel 23, 15 says this, one day near Horish, David received the news that Saul was on his way to Ziph to search for him and kill him. Jonathan went to David secretly. Jonathan found where David was at in the desert, hiding in the mountain caves, and he went to him, and what did he do? Encouraged him. And this is how he encouraged him in three things. He said he encouraged him to stay strong in his faith. You need to find friends who will encourage you to stay strong in your faith. It's exactly what David needed. He just got news that the entire Israeli army has now found out where he's at, 
hiding in the wilderness, and now they're, they're descending upon him to kill him and his family and his children and all of the people that are there. And here comes Jonathan to say, be strong in your faith in God. The second thing Jonathan encouraged him to do was to, to it says, don't be afraid, Jonathan assured him. Jonathan encouraged David to break out of fear, to not give in to a spirit of fear. I is a good friend. And the third thing that Jonathan encouraged David in was he encouraged him in his prophetic destiny. The next thing says, Jonathan assured him, my father will never find you. That's amazing. His father had all the resources. David had none. He says, my father will never find you. Why? He says, you are going to be the king of Israel. This is the next king of Israel saying, I'm not going to be the king of Israel. You're going to be the king of Israel. Jonathan's an absolute hero. He says, you're going to be the king of Israel, and I will be next to you as my father Saul is well aware. So the two of them renewed their solemn pact before the Lord, and Jonathan returned home. When it says Jonathan loved him as he loved himself, he truly, Jonathan, when he saw the grace of God on David's life and he could see the destiny on David, he said, I'm not going to fight it. I'm, I'm going to encourage it. I'm not going to be the next king, Jonathan says. You are. And I'm going to be next to you as your friend. While you're ruling and reigning over Israel, I'm going to be there as a friend to the king. You guys, we need covenantal friendships. I want us to conclude with Ecclesiastes. It's a great scripture about why you need somebody in your life. Why you need some friends. You do. You need some friends, guys. But believe God for not just any friends. Believe God for covenantal friendships, that are friendships made powerful by the blood of Christ, who are going to encourage you when you're low, who are going to say, don't give into a spirit of fear. I know it's hard. Don't do it. You've got a destiny over your life. I see it. Let me speak it out to you when you're at your lowest point. Let me encourage you right now. This is what Ecclesiastes says. Ecclesiastes, let's stand up as we read it. I mean, I'll read it, but you can receive it. Ecclesiastes 4 says this. Two are better than one. Jeff, could you just come stand next to me while we read this? I love this passage. If you've got a husband or wife next to you, hold their hand. Because you should be a Jonathan to your David and David to your Jonathan. This is, this is the most powerful covenantal relationship you could ever have. Why? Because two are better than one. Because they have a good return for their labor. That's really powerful. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. I think of that um, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. It wasn't our 20th wedding anniversary. On the tw our 20th wedding anniversary, Jeff was praying to the Lord, and God said, I get more glory from you and Autumn being married than I would have if you were single. It's a good return for your labor. If either, either of them falls down, one can help the other up. Thank you for helping me up all the time. But pity, but pity on anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can you keep warm alone? See, this is why when I, my toes are cold, you need to let me put them underneath your leg. <laughs> I always try to like put them underneath his leg. He's like, what are you doing with those cold toes? I'm like, my feet are cold, honey. But I think if he wants to keep the bedroom the temperature of a polar vortex, that I should get to put my cold toes underneath his warm leg. <laughs> it's compromise. <laughs> So if two lie down together, they can keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. 
a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I ask that you would help us, God, to be a family that absolutely brings glory to your name. Lord, I pray that James River Church, God, that we would be Jonathan's to each other. Jonathan and David friendships would arise out of this room, Lord, from husbands and wives, but also from other uh, members in the church, Lord, that we would be ones that encourage, protect, speak destiny, that we would, we would rebuke lies off of people, that we would go to battle for one another like Jonathan did for David. Lord, that we would be loyal, that we would not be fault-finding. Lord, I pray you would anoint us to live counterculturally in this church, Lord. And to honor you and to honor each other. Lord, we thank you for this word. Amen. Amen. God bless you.